I'm Dr. Joseph M.T., Department of Sociology, University of Mumbai. This is uh, E. Patshala, the paper on religion and society, module one, in which we will look at outlining the scope and nature of the interrelationship between religion and society in India. Now, both in sociology and anthropology and other social sciences as well, the interrelationship between religion and society is a, a, a subject on which from its very beginning, a lot of people have given attention to. Now, religion and society and culture, all three are interrelated. Now, in this entire paper on religion and society, we are looking at the different facets of this interrelationship. So, for, first we look at the classical sociological theories like Emil Durkheim, Max Weber and Karl Marx and the way that they have looked at religion, society, interrelationship. Then we also take ideas from the evolutionary paradigm that has reigned in cultural anthropology, mainly the classical cultural anthropologists such as uh, Morgan, Tyler and Spencer. Now, in this particular paper, we also look at very, very clearly the location of modernity and the colonial baggage, or rather the orientalist baggage that has actually influenced the studies in sociology of religion and therefore we look at very specifically Indian situation giving priority to the Indian context and looking at how the Indian situation impinges upon this relationship in a big manner. So this is what we are about to do in this particular paper and this module is a sort of an introduction to this. Introduction we look at the contradictory perceptions of modernity, the role of rationality and secularization, religion and primordial solidarities in the Indian context, and the nature of religious diversity. Now I begin with the contradictory perceptions of modernity. In fact, what is modernity? We all understand modernity as being modern, but modernity has a historical context. Modernity is a historical process which began in Western Europe with enlightenment and other related processes and changes. Modernity in that sense meant way in which religion becomes privatized. Religion before the modern world meant everything. Religion had all the answers. But in modernity, religion becomes a private matter. The influence of religion in other areas of life becomes lesser and lesser. And the people of that time, I mean the French Enlightenment and related periods, they celebrated this kind of uh, division between society and religion. Social relations, economic behavior, cultural patterns, morality, all of these was no more to be completely dictated by religion, but as they would say, to be in such manner influenced by rationality and science. Now this is what we mean by modernity. Now this modernity, people call it normative modernity, European modernity or whatever, spread to the rest of the world through processes of colonization or even through processes of uh, education. And uh, then people started looking at this phenomenon and uh, people from other locations such as India found it difficult because this religion society divide is not in the manner that it has happened in Europe, it has not happened in India. Or in the to the Indian mind, the religion society divide does not have as much currency as in the European context. And therefore, people talked about an Indian modernity. An Indian modernity would be not a separation between religion and society or politics, but the way that this interrelationship changes over a period of time or new forms of this relationship develop. So this is uh, what we can say by contradictory perceptions of modernity. So today, for example, Arjun Appadurai and others would talk about multiple modernities, which means that modernity is a phenomenon that has historically developed across the world in different ways. And therefore, one cannot privilege European modernity as modernity. So this is something that goes well with we Indians and we in India feel that Indian modernity is different from European modernity. Though European modernity has a value in itself, in India we understand it differently. So this is what we mean by contradictory perceptions of modernity. 
Then we come to the next point, which is the role of rationality and secularization. Rationality, as I said before, reason, the supremacy of reason, is something that uh, modernists celebrated, that uh, reason and science becomes the most important kind of parameters for any kind of a knowledge construction. And uh, this is something that modernists well don't do, and they spread to the rest of the world. Now, this is uh, something very important in religion, because is religion rational? Can we look at rationality and religion as interconnected and some would say no religion is not rational it can be reasonable but not rational and then we have this entire process that people talk about secularization again I would say a very European kind of uh, an invention because secularization if you understand is a process through which the influence of religion in public life becomes less and less. That process is what secularization is. So secularization would mean that uh, more and more areas of human life, so social relations, cultural patterns, all of that is uh, away from religion in that manner. So in that sense, the understanding of reason and secularization are related. And uh, then we go to the, the third point, which is religion and primordial solidarities in the Indian context. Now, primordial would mean that something that we get before birth or with birth. Now, what is a primordial solidarity? Now, this is a very uh, a clever kind of a word for which uh, we have other names like caste and community and tribe and clan and all of that. These are all primordial solidarities. Now, if I, I am part of a clan and that is something that I have not chosen, I'm born into a clan. If I am part of a caste, that is not something that I have not chosen. So that is what we mean by primordial solidarities, which means that the kind of solidarities which we have not chosen, that are given to us due to our birth. Now, how do these solidarities and religion mix in the Indian context? Or in other words, tribe, clan, kinship and religion and caste. How do they mix? Caste and religion, tribe and religion, clan and religion, kinship and religion. So that interrelationship is something that we look at with regard to religion and primordial solidarities. And then last we go to what we call the nature of religious diversity. Now religions are diverse, religious philosophies are diverse, religious communities are diverse, religious practices are diverse and even within each religion there are different ways in which people practice that religion. For example sects and cults and you know subgroups and all of that. So that we will look at that religious diversity as well. Now to summarize, we are looking at religion in the context of modernity, rationality, secularization, the way that religion relates to caste, class tribe, gender and uh, clan and then we look at the extent of religious diversity in India. We go on to the next part of this particular module which is on theoretical and conceptual orientations. Now in sociology that this just would mean the way that we are giving doing a review of the people who have actually looked at religion. So we start with sociological approaches to the study of religion in the writings of Karl Marx, Emil Durkheim and Max Weber. Now this is too huge a material to talk about but just to, to summarize uh, Karl Marx would look at religion from a materialist point of view because for Karl Marx what matters is matter in that sense the way that Karl Marx privileges the base structure over the superstructure he would say that uh, in, in simple words what I do to make a living has a lot of influence on my thought and a lot of influence on what the society does so Karl Marx's uh, this particular notion of uh, privileging what is materialist over what is ideological is something something very very novel and something that has revolutionized the way that we look at life and that the way that we look at religion. So in that sense uh, a Marxian understanding of religion would actually say that religion itself has evolved out of the relations that people have which is based on their work on their occupation and uh, Marx's understanding of religion would also be obviously Marx would uh, categorize religion as part of the superstructure along with uh, education the legal system ideology and all of that and therefore Marx would say that uh, religion as an ideology actually represents the interests of the ruling class and the interest of the working class will not get represented in religion because as an ideology the ideology itself reigning ideologies are all of the reigning classes the ruling classes and the ideologies of the subordinate class does not get uh, that kind of a representation so this is in a nutshell a Marxian way of looking at religion and there are many others who have looked at it uh, from a 
Marxian point of view later. Now coming to Emil Durkheim. Emil Durkheim is someone who has pioneered the studies in religion and society through his work, the elementary forms of the religious life. Now Durkheim looks at religion from, uh, I would say, a functionalist point of view, by which he means, he says that uh, when we look at religion, we need to look at what does religion do? And then he talks about the way that religion brings about solidarity, what he calls collective consciousness. So, and that becomes a kind of a function of religion for him. And uh, Durkheim, for example, would look at, uh, you know, a very fascinating kind of an idea that he comes out is that he would say that uh, religion itself is based on the division of the world into two realms, into two areas, which is sacred and the profane. And what religion does is, what every religion does is, it defines something as sacred and it defines something as profane. And religion system uh, makes a system of ritual and a system of uh, relationships whereby the sacred and the profane are kept separate. And if at all they meet, they never meet. If at all they come in some kind of uh, a distant contact, religion gives us the mechanism to do that. So, and then this kind of a division of the sacred and the profane and in the associated structures, how that uh, makes people to come to formations of what he calls a church or a religious community is what religion is for Durkheim. So obviously Durkheim is giving a very functionalist understanding of religion in the sense that uh, he looks at what religion does for human life and for society. Then we come to Max Weber. Obviously Max Weber has uh, more than many writings of his own religion. He has uh, the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism. He has religion of India, religions of China. He has a book on Jainism and uh, Judaism and all of that. Now Weber looked at religion from a very different point of view. First of all, we know that uh, Weber gives a lot of importance to the subjective meaning in social life. And therefore, in religion as well, Weber's focus is on what meaning has a social actor got for a particular religious practice or a particular religious structure. Then something very interesting that Weber has developed is also the different classes of people or what we class specific religiosity. For example, he would talk about um, virtuous or religion, religion of uh, the ritual specialist or religion of the what we call the elite, religious elite and the religious elite. So both of these are two different ways in which Weber would understand religion. In addition to this, Weber also looks at the interconnection between religion and economic activity or social activity. How certain religious ideas and principles have a direct impact on the way that we conduct our economic and social life. So that is in a nutshell that Weber is talking about. Then we go to the next major topic, which is anthropological approaches to the study of rituals and beliefs in non-Western communities. Now, we know that uh, initially, if anyone, any European studied European society, that was considered sociology. And if any European, non-European society, it was considered anthropology. So that is why we said anthropological approaches to the study of rituals and belief in non-Western communities. And many of these initial scholars were Westerners, Western European scholars and Americans scholars who studied other people other people's rituals beliefs and practices and all of that in a sense it was all exotic we will be analyzing some of these as well in the, in the next module then we come to religious studies in the social sciences the development of a problematic relationship some comparisons of the development in the western India now the issue is that social sciences have a methodology and that methodology is critical now how do we apply such a critical mind to religion this is very difficult because uh, can there be critical approaches to religion? Yes, to some extent. And we all know that critical approaches to religion, a specific religion gives rise to new sects and new cults and all of that. But a very a critical approach to religion from a rational standpoint is something very problematic because people who are believing in religion, believers of religion would not allow or would not like their religion being critiqued, their religion being subjected to a rational scientific approach. So it is very problematic and uh, there has been issues of this kind in India and the West. Then we come to the last point which is Indological and Orientalist constructions of religion in India. Now, Indology and Orientalism, these are two major categorizations of European scholarship on India. During the colonial period, some Europeans who studied on India developed a field that is called Indology or the study of India. Now, what we mean by Indology is that many of these European scholars had very uh, favorable ideas about what is happening in India. They studied Indian religions, Indian religious structures 
scriptures, Indian religious scriptures, Indian religious practice very in a deep manner and with a very favorable mind. People like Mass Muller and William Jones and all of these people are can be categorized into Indology and some earlier Indian writers approached this method. Now, Orientalism is a word coined by Edward Said and in Edward Said's way, Orientalism is an ideology whereby the West constructs its other. It would just mean if you are looking at Orientalist constructions of religion in India, we are looking at the way in which the Western scholars have you know, looked at re religions in India as something very, very different, as something opposite to what is in Europe. So these are the two different things that we are looking at. Now we go to the next topic which is uh, religious diversity in India. Now this is a big topic in itself. So in this we have first religion or a way of life, the ongoing debate in Hinduism. Now the question is what is Hinduism? Who is a Hindu? Now this is uh, a problematic thing because Hinduism as a religion if we can call that is uh, very plural. It has no one book. It has no one nothing which is a single thing to identify itself. So some people started saying it's not a religion it's a way of life. Now the issue is that um, it issue is that when we say something is religion and something is not the word religion itself is problematic because religion as a word has its origin in in Western understanding and therefore the Semitic religious world of the Islam, Judaism and Christianity become so much normative to the word religion. So for example if you look at uh, India or if you look at words in the Indian languages for religion which are they and uh, today we are using the word dharma. Now dharma uh, originally never meant religion. Dharma meant uh, duty or dharma meant uh, duty of caste or duty of family or so we had uh, all those kul dharam for example. So dharma was a word which was used for the the duties and rights of people who belong to a particular group or who followed a particular style now how do we use that word to use religion it is not true so then what are we saying so in for example in india we have words like guru parampara for example or we have words like panth or in uh, punjab we have word like dera or you have words like sampradaya now these were words that were used in india to refer to different religious systems now unfortunately we are trying to use the word religion and fit it into any of these and then people are saying that hinduism is not a religion it's a way of life it somehow doesn't fit in we need to understand that in south asia uh, being religious is very different from anywhere else in the world. We have a different way of religious life here, which uh, according to certain European constructions, they say is syncretic or whatever. Now the issue is that it is plural. It has no one text, no one spiritual head, one, no one uh, practice. It is very diverse and it is plural and that's the way it is. And therefore, to apply the word religion in a very Western sense and say Hinduism is not religion is something very European and it's very Orientalist, I would say. And therefore, we need to understand religion itself in a very wide manner. So that is one of the debate that we can talk about. Then we look at the Buddhism and Jainism which are very different from Hinduism classically and also if you look at their text and if they look at their history. So like for example historians like Romila Thapar or Uma Chakravarti they make a distinction between the Shramanic and the Brahmanic traditions in India. So we can very clearly say India always had a tradition of the mendicant, the people, the renouncer who went around from one place to another and that uh, developed its own tradition which we can call the Shramana tradition in Indian tradition. So uh, Buddhism and Jainism have their roots in the Shramana tradition or the monastic tradition. Then we come to the Indian church. What we mean by the Indian church is Christianity in India, which again is very diverse. All possible sects and denominations in the West are represented in India by its members in India. It's a very diverse kind of a practice that we see in the Indian Christianity, which we will have uh, more to say when we come to that particular module. Then we have uh, something very interesting in Indian tradition, what we call the practice of bhakti, the bhakti tradition. Now, what is specific about bhakti? Because religion before bhakti, I would say historically was uh, only meant for people who were knowledgeable. It was uh, more connected to ritual, it was more connected to what we call Gyan and therefore religion and religious worship and practice was only concentrated in the hands of the Brahmins. Now Bhakti meant that uh, the idea that every person can have a direct relationship with our gods or goddesses and this direct relationship of devotion which we call Bhakti is uh, religion itself and therefore we don't need religious specialists. We don't need any ritual specialists and therefore a 
whole lot of movements in India arose, which can be categorized as bhakti. For example, the most defining movement in Maharashtra, the Varkari Sampradaya, is a bhakti movement. So is uh, the Basava movement of in Karnataka, and then you have bhakti movements in Tamil Nadu. We have the bhakti of Kabir, bhakti of uh, a whole lot of other bhakti saints, Mirabai, and everybody else. And these are all bhakti traditions which talked about one's direct relationship with God or a goddess, and that's enough. Nothing else is needed. So you don't need Brahman, you don't need a actual specialist and all of that. Then we come to very interesting idea of the Navayana Buddhism. We know that Buddhism originated in India. Buddhism spread. to different parts of the world and at some point buddhism somehow was no more in india now this is a historical fact now how did buddhism die in india obviously no religious or religious community which was thriving can just die off like that which means there has been violence there has been some ideological violence there has been physical violence through which buddhism has completely wiped off from india so we have in the person of dr baba saheb ambedkar someone who actually brought buddhism back to india in a very major way and that is the word that today we use for it navayana the new yana now this particular word navayana has its origin in baba saheb himself because in 1956 the day before his conversion to buddhism which the day was 14th october he gave a press conference where which he said the buddhism that i am going to convert into is neither mahayana nor theravada i am converting into very new interpretation of buddhism which is also originally the true buddhism so i am converting myself and my people into buddhism which is original and which is real and therefore which Which goes beyond the the doctrinal divisions of both Mahayana and Hinayana or Theravada. So when we look at from that perspective, and then what name do we give to this Buddhism? Now that is uh, now in Maharashtra, for example, people would say I am a now both, or other people would tell others that he is a now or she is now both. That is one way of looking at it. But it will be a better word that we use for it will be Navayana, a new interpretation of Buddhism in the context of modernity and all of that. So that is the word that we have used here, Navayana Buddhism. so that is with regard to religious diversity in india now we go to the next section which is about structure and practice that is the structures of religion and practices of religion in this uh, we have uh, first sect and cult now what is a sect and what is a cult first of all we need to understand from the very beginning that these are western words sect and cult now for example when we say something is a sect it has got a very western christian meaning sect means when there is a religious community and you have a rebellious idea and then you break off and you start a new movement that is called a sect and therefore sect has got that kind of a negative meaning and the cult is something that you set up your own particular religious practice and uh, independently of others and that you call a cult now i would say that we cannot apply the same meaning in india because in india when you say something is a sect it is something that is a uh, broken off from something which was original in india all of these traditions have not broken off from anywhere there is nothing original everything is there and therefore the use of the word sect in india and cult in india will not stand and therefore we need to use uh, indian words like uh, panth a panth is not a sect or sampradaya sampradaya is not a sect and it is high time we avoid use of the word sect and cult and come to indian term. which would be more meaningful to our context all right we go to the next one which is mysticism now mysticism is a, a form of religious practice which is everywhere west and east and in india and everywhere who is a mystic a mystic is one who has in his or her practice of religion in his or her understanding of religion holds um, gives a lot of space for what we call mystery the idea that everything in life cannot be explained through science or explained through rationality alone there are realities which are beyond so someone who gives that kind of an emphasis is a mystic then we have we look at god men and god women as well and we look at the ascetic tradition we'll come to these new modules and we will explain it more then we have pilgrimages pilgrimage is a, is a part of religious life and in india we have uh, yatras happening all over so pilgrimage is uh, something that uh, happens with religions in a very major way then we have festivals that we celebrate then we have something called religious performance and then we look at the temple complex that concludes that section we go to the next one which is religion and identity now identity means the sense of who i am and identity has got uh, many interrelated aspects one is how do i understand myself about who am i and uh, theories of identity would say it would also mean how do we construct the self and how do we construct the other 
I understand myself very clearly when I know that I am not you or I am not he or I am not she. Now how do I make this distinction? The way that we make this distinction is something that we call identity. How does religion come into this? This is what we are looking at it. So first we have a religion and caste. Now religion and caste and its identity, how do they interplay with each other? Like the way that caste gives an identity, has does religion also give an identity or in some cases caste is religion or religion is caste and how does this work out we will look at it then we look at religion and Indian modernity as I said earlier modernity is multiple there is something called an Indian modernity what we call the Indian Renaissance and things like that and how does religion fit in there then we look at this entire process or the entire kind of ways in which we look at minority identities the discussion on minorities in India we know minority can be linguistic also but here we look at religious minorities and their questions of identity then we look at reform movements. You know, in India there has been a lot of uh, discussion on reform movements in the last part of the 19th century and the 20th century. Then we go on to the next uh, section which is religion, ideology and conflict. In this we look at uh, this word which we use quite often in India, secularism. We look at uh, the nation and Hinduism, Hindu nationalism. Again we look at another word which we use in India a lot, communalism. We look at the Ram Janam Bhumi movement, we look at the politics of religious conversions and we look at uh, what we call intolerance and sectarian strife in India which means uh, the way that we look at interrelationship between the different sampradayas historically and in the present context. Then we go on to the next section which is continuity and change. So you have uh, what we call syncretism. Syncretism would just mean the what we can today call hybridity. Now those days uh, this word was not there. Syncretism would mean the way that uh, we take practices which are strictly of another religion and we make it our own. So syncretism would mean that uh, a kind of a mix of practices which have got its origin in different religious worlds or different cultural worlds and uh, so that is something in a way that most of the people in India who practice religion are actually practicing in it in a syncretic manner. Then we look at uh, the influence of patriarchy on religion and uh, this is an area which is well researched where we see that all religious traditions across the world have patriarchal structures, patriarchal discourses and patriarchal practices. Then we look at also gender and religiosity, for example, what are, how do religions and religious communities look at homosexuality, for example. Then we look at globalization of religion and tele-evangelism, which is uh, an American import to the rest of the world. And we look at religion in the 21st century. And finally, we come to a section on methodology. What method do we use to study religion? So in that we go back to what we first said about Marx, Durkheim and Weber on the sociology of religion. I mentioned about the materialist, the functionalist and the substantive ways in which or the interpretive ways in which Marx, Durkheim and Weber respectively have looked at religion. And in that sense, a materialist understanding, a functionalist understanding and an interpretive understanding become uh, three different methodologies of study religion in India and then the question is that what methodology do we adopt to study religion in the Indian context and that is where we have not it I would say we have not it uh, evolved a clear way of looking at religion but one big thing that we need to do is that we need to look at South Asian religiosity as something very very different and uh, we should be very careful in importing words uh, from the Semitic religious worldview or from the European context to understand the Indian context and then we look at at, uh, uh, how do we understand uh, religious diversity and as I mentioned before words like sect and cult and how do we understand in India and what are the alternatives that you can actually make with regard to the religious diversity in India conclusion module one we have looked at a kind of a, a summary of the content of the course that we are doing namely the interrelationship between religion and society with specific reference to the Indian context. The Indian context would mean religiosity which is very different from Western countries and it would also mean the legacy of colonialism, legacy of orientalist construction of power and knowledge. And this is exactly what we have looked at in this module which is an introduction to the entire paper. Thank you.